Next talk is for anyone who, like me, has their eyes on their boss's job. He sat right there. He doesn't mind. He knows I'm joking. Um, so we have uh, Mahanid here from HelloFresh, who's going to be talking about how to make the transition from development to management. So please give a big round of applause to Mahanid. Uh, can I get the please? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, oh, I have the mic here. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just say it in front. Um, so thank you all for coming out today. Um, just before I start, uh, for the sake of doing a small social experiment, show of hands, how many people knew the topic of this talk before they entered the room, or like before this slide? One, <laughs> two, <laughs> good, good. It's just that I, um, just a couple of hours ago, I realized that the agenda just has HelloFresh. So uh, for those of you who didn't know the topic, I would like to thank you for your courage. Um, it, your blind trust will not go unrewarded, so you could have easily signed up for uh, a session of corporate propaganda, but this is not it. Um, hopefully you get something nice out of this. So, so the topic of my talk today is basically about um, making the transition into management, which comes as a series, as part of a series that I'm trying to develop called Lessons in Engineering Leadership, which basically uh, distills some of my own experience and the experience of, people's around, uh, of people around me um, making their way into a career in management and engineering. Um, first of all, a little bit about myself. So uh, my name is Mohanad. I currently work as VP Engineering at HelloFresh. Um, I lead uh, in my current role the consumer facing engineering organization which is basically responsible for building all the features and the products that our customers um, use on the day to day and I'll talk about the product itself in a second. Um, I was also very lucky to have been part of the massive upscaling um, uh, process that HelloFresh had gone through over the last years. So I participated together with my colleagues in scaling the technology organization from around 15 people to over 200. Right at the moment today, I think we're over 250 in technology um, um, as part of like a much wider uh, scale up with, uh, that happened with the company. So a little bit about HelloFresh, uh, for people who are less familiar with it, I think it's not that known here in, uh, in Portugal. Um, so basically, as soon as, the, as soon as I go to the next slide, I can tell you more. Um, so basically, HelloFresh, we're the global category leader in the meal kit industry, and what that means is basically we ship uh, to your doorstep a meal kit that basically has all the ingredients for some really nice and healthy and delicious recipes that you can get to enjoy. Uh, cooking at home with your family without having to worry about the hassle of um, coming up with the recipes or doing the grocery shopping or any of the sort. Um, we currently operate in 11 different geographies uh, across North America, Europe, and Australia. Um, and we're currently number one, uh, not only globally, but also in almost every market that we operate in, uh, with the exception of the smaller markets that we've just entered um, very recently. Um, just to give you like the a bit of roundup in numbers to just show you the sheer size of the category, which is also not a very uh, particularly famous category. Um, we currently ship our product to close to 2 million households globally. Last quarter alone, we've shipped 50 million different meals, and uh, we have more than 3,000 employees running this operation across all the different 11 countries. So now to the topic of this uh, talk, um, which is basically, as I was saying, it's about engineers making the transition to management. And to set the stage and to give a bit of context, I think it's very common that in, um, in the engineers, as they start their careers, they get into an engineering or a software development job, they start getting successful at what they do, um, and then they find themselves contemplating about something that everyone contemplates about, which is basically their career progression. They ask themselves question, questions of, um, is this my, am I, achieve, am I fulfilling my potential? Is this the, b the best impact I have? Is, um, um, am I accomplishing the things I want to do? Um, and what would be the next step in my career, right? And they find themselves at this crossroad when it comes to engineering, and I think this applies to other professions as well, which is basically whether you take a path in an, being an individual contributor and you go on into a technical kind of career path, or would you make a transition into management and start managing teams and teams of teams and so on and so forth. Technology is a demanding profession. Um, as a software engineer, it takes a lot of time and investment into staying on top of things to, to remain successful at your craft. And, uh, but at the same time, all of this effort that you put into becoming a, b a better software engineer doesn't necessarily prepare you for a job in management. Um, if you 
if you think about all the skills that the senior engineer actually accumulates over time, it doesn't necessarily uh, prepare them to what it takes to run a team. And this, I think, creates a lot of fear and creates some challenges for people getting into management for the first time. If we look, if we try to take a deeper look about how, uh, what, like how the different roles uh, look like, and also just to, to set the same kind of context for everyone that's hearing this, um, uh, this talk, um, if you look at an individual contributor, an individual contributor basically is primarily concerned working on developing the product, just on execution. In the context of a software engineer, they manage machines, they manage code, they don't necessarily manage people. Uh, when it comes to leadership, they don't necessarily lead by managing the people and telling them what to do or, or any of the thing of that sort, but they lead through influence, they lead through mentorship and so on. And the reward is basically based on their performance as an engineer, on their technical capability, and also on their productivity. Whereas if you look at a, at a people manager, a people manager does a job that is entirely different. They manage people uh, as opposed to the first person and they contribute a lot less to the, to the product itself. They are not the ones doing the execution themselves, and their reward is not for um, their technical capability or their, um, uh, their productivity, it's actually for the collective success of the team and what the team is capable of doing. Right, so if you look, if you put these on, uh, uh, as two contrasting points, it's very easy to see the gap of preparation that it takes to become an engineer. And this is where a lot of people, uh, to become a manager, sorry, and this is where a lot of people start facing different challenges when they get into management. But the good news here is that people are not that different. We always say that uh, human beings are unique and everything which is true, but at the same time, there are patterns to how we do things. There are patterns to the challenges that everyone has been facing over time. And through patterns we learn and there are learnings that then we can standardize and we can share with everyone else. And today in this talk I would like to talk to you about some of the patterns that I've experienced myself but also I've experienced through people around me who got into careers of engineering management. Um, but before we dive into the learnings themselves, I would like to just debunk something like straight up just to get it out of the way. Um, there is no such a thing as natural born leaders. This is just, this is a myth that is propagated by people with fixed mindsets who are very protective of their advantage. And this, is, this simply is not true. Leadership is just a skill, like every other skill that people can learn and develop. To become a good manager, it's a set of smaller skills and a set of tools that you can improve on and you get better at and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much it. It's a job like any other job. There is no one that's born inherently better at it or, uh, or, or worse. Um, I understand, of course, that there are people who are inherently better at certain things than others, so it's true. It could take you a little more effort to get better at giving feedback, for example, than the person next to you. But at the end of the day, this is not rocket science. This is uh, people management is not curing cancer, and portraying management as curing cancer creates an artificial obstacle that is not healthy for organizations or individuals or anyone else. So um, anyone should feel like confident getting into this kind of role. So about the, some of the, the learnings that I want to talk to, to you today, I think the first one I would like to talk about is um, what I call leadership definition, um, which is basically something that you can, um, that happens quite often. So if you look, if you look at any team, uh, if you observe how they interact, it happens quite often that you see someone who is very influential within their team, There's someone that is respected by their peers, someone that can, um, basically leads the discourse and the day-to-day -day interactions of the team, um, and people naturally follow that person into like uh, the, their execution and they feel like they have this natural tendency to follow that person. Um, but it's very important at this point to not confuse thought leadership with people leadership. These are two different things. These are entirely different career paths. These are entirely different jobs. And confu confusing them is very problematic. Actually, if you look at a lot of the successful companies today, they have catered to these two different, very different needs in leadership. And these are actually two very different career paths, whether you want to grow as a thought leader or you want to grow as a people uh, leader or a people manager. What happens, is, what happens is whether it's the person themselves who doesn't know what they're signing up for or the leadership of the company is seeing this in a person and trying to push that person into a management role without necessarily creating the, setting the right context, is what you do is you put someone in a job that they were not necessarily looking forward to have and you're, they're not necessarily set up for success in that area and you end up losing one of your best engineers to trade that person for a not very good manager. Right? 
So I think it's just making that distinction early on is very important to understand what do you actually want in your next step. You know, like if it's technical and thought leadership that you seek, it's not about people management, it's not about managing their people and their career and the development and so on, it's something entirely different. Um, so it's just about setting the right expectations and understanding what you're signing up for from the beginning. <clears throat> the second um, learning that I would like to also share with you today is what I call the, the, the challenge of the indirect impact. And this is something that I personally uh, suffered from uh, for a bit. So what happens is, as, as you take a step up into management, you're automatically taking a step back from the execution, right? And the higher you go, the further back from execution that you, that, that you go. And that makes it a lot harder to, to have a good grasp of your actual productivity or the kind of impact you're making and so on. As an engineer, you have a direct closed feedback loop. You know, you get a ticket or you get a user story, you built it, you ship it through production and it's done. You know, you know exactly what you've done. You have, you do a good job, you can immediately know that you did a good job. You do a bad job, you also immediately know that you've done a bad job. But as you become a manager, uh, you start losing this kind of direct feedback loop of like your direct impact on things and how you contribute to the actual work. And this can get frustrating very quickly because people start questioning themselves. They start having this kind of imposter syndrome is what is my actual contribution to the team? This team could be successful or not without me, you know? This is something that goes to the minds of a lot of people. And uh, the learning here is that you need to get comfortable very, very quickly understanding exactly what is your role, you know? Your accountability is for the sum of the, the success, or your success is the sum of the success of every single member in your team. And your job right now is not anymore about getting any direct credit or any direct uh, recognition. You know? Your job right now is about the collective success of the team. And as long as that's happening, this is where you'll be successful and this is how you'll keep growing. Um, and the flip side to this is actually more important. You know? it's, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that you, like, in order to become a successful manager, you have to get so many little decisions right in a row, all the time. You do all of these small decisions, all the small things on the day-to-day -day right in a row, and it's very easy to mess up. And the size, like, the impact of a mistake that you make as a manager is a lot higher than the impact of a mistake that you can make as, a, as a, an individual contributor. And just knowing that, like, actually, like, if you are able to allow your team to work without messing up, this is already extremely successful, you know? So it's just a change in the mindset of how you look at your impact and how you look at how your contribution to the, to the work. <clears throat> the, um, another important learning that I'd like to share to you today is um, a learning of what I call the ruthless prioritization. And to, to take a step back and see where, to tell you where I'm coming from on this, on this point, um, it's basically, if you look at a lot of the new managers, like this happens quite often. I've seen it in almost every person that we have put as a manager at HelloFresh. They, be, they start a job as a new manager, they're trying to fix the world. They're trying to fix the company, they're trying to fix everything. They're looking for all the things that they can improve to bring about change and make things better, you know? But this is very, very dangerous. And you can see the same pattern happening over and over again. What this creates is A, first of all, they start too many things and it becomes insanely impossible to keep up with all of these things which results in one of two scenarios. There's no other alternative. Either you do all of these things and you burn out, or you fail colossally, you know? Like, there has to be one of the two. The second thing that comes out of this is that you find people, when you're always looking for things to fix, you know, you're always looking for problems, this becomes your reality, you know? You are a team that is always looking for problems. It becomes a very, very negative environment, you know? Despite of all the good, you lose sight of the good things that are happening. You lose sight of all the things that you've got right. But you're just, you're, this course is all about problems and becomes really, really demotivating. So the advice that I give in this situation is, make sure that you have a, like a very ruthless prioritization framework. You understand extremely well the relative priority of all the million things you need to do, sort them out in priorities, and then just, you need to get very, very comfortable with the fact that you will pick the top three to five things and you will literally watch everything else burn for a long time until you're able to cater to these things. And, but the comfort that you find here, like you know that this is, thing is burning, but you know because you're investing all of your energy in, keeping, in doing something else that has a much, much higher impact on your organization and your team. And you start off the next planning round, this next quarter, next, I don't know, month, or whatever, whatever your cycle is, with a new baseline of problems that you have solved thoroughly, that they don't come back, and then you work on different problems. 
Coupled with that, I think it's really important to have as a manager like a very rigorous organization, like self-organization techniques, you know? As an engineer, it's really easy to hold a lot of the information in, in your mind, you know? Like I know all the things I need to do, like my task list is limited, it's easy, I know exactly what I need to do, but as a manager, your task list starts growing exponentially. The different paths that you have, like the, all the different things that you need to follow up on, all the different things that will come at different times and so on, they become extremely stressful to deal with and this can get overwhelming very, very quickly. So you need to, from the beginning, start using some advanced uh, like organization techniques and they're not necessarily that advanced, they're not, they're not uh, like strange to anyone, you know. F like first step, write everything down. Don't hold thing, anything in your head. You get a thought, you have a to-do list, just write it down and then come back to it later. I personally use a technique um, that is also a very old technique called getting things done. Uh, the name is, as suggest, helps you get things done. Um, and basically, like, it has this concept of like a brain dump. Every time you know that you need to do something or you think of something to do, you just dump it in an inbox, and then you have a cycle of going through this inbox, and like, they have also like a way to go through it and like shuffle through it. So just get comfortable from the beginning using tools and techniques to help you organize yourselves. A lot of people I know, they use like Trello boards or they use whatever to do app. They use to just keep track of all the things they need to do. <clears throat> on a on a more like on a on a, on a people on a on a on a more people centric side of things in management, I think this is a very very important point that I also like to touch, which is a bit of a change in. Um, a change in context from the other points that I've been talking about or the learnings I've talked about, I think this one is extremely important. As a new manager, you often don't, from the beginning, acknowledge the power that you have, you know? Power structures exist, like there are power dynamics that happen, we, as much as we would like to say we're all friends and like the, the guys in my team are like my friends we got for beers every weekend and all of these things, but we work in hierarchical organizations that have power dynamics and the, this is how things are set up. And it's important to acknowledge this because this can have like very severe effects on your team. For example, if you walk into a room in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with one of your, the people in your team, before anyone says any word, you are automatically the more powerful person in the room. You know? And this comes with a lot of responsibility because the same language or the same choice of words or the same kind of things you would bring um, uh, to this kind of conversation uh, in a previous context before you become the manager, a lot of that becomes invalid and not the best choice of words when you're the manager. You have to be a lot more careful about how you articulate yourself and acknowledge your power. If you think about like even simpler examples, you know, if your colleague, someone in your team calls you at 9 p.m. tells you like, hey, there's this thing that's broken, like, hey, could you do it? You feel little obligation to actually take care of this at 9 p.m. on a weekday or on a weekend, whatever, you know. The same person becomes your manager, calls you at 9 p.m. to tell you the same thing. It's an entirely different story. You feel a much higher level of obligation. Like now it's my manager who holds my salary review and my performance review and all of these things, telling me about something that's broken at 9 p.m. Maybe I should take a look, you know? So you need to keep your power in check and understand that now you play a different role and be very careful about how you phrase things and what you ask of your team. Last but not least, and this is what I'd like to, like to summarize, I can go on for for a long time with the different learnings we, we went through over the years. But finally, like nothing is permanent. A lot of people fear getting into management because they feel like this is a, a fork in their, cross, like in their career path that is very difficult to revert. But it's not really true. This is, this is not how careers work. This is not how anyone has done it. A lot of people have changed the roles over time, over the years. The most important thing is always try to figure out the role that where you feel accomplished, where you feel happy, where you feel that you're um, doing the things you'd like to do. And if that's not the case, when you get into a different role, switch back, switch something else. Nothing is permanent. You always have more choice than you think. And uh, this is just something that is important to keep in mind. Um, I have, ending this with a quote, despite my, uh, like my quotes are not my favorite thing of, uh, of uh, talks and conferences, but basically <laughs> Trump Preston says a career path is really a path at all. A more interesting life is usually a more crooked winding path of missteps, luck and vigorous work. Um, which is exactly what I was um, just saying, it's basically like even compound, like to compound this even more, a lot of the things that will happen in your career are either results of like other external factors or results of what you, uh, decisions that you make yourself and so on. So just get comfortable with the idea that it's not always gonna be a straight line, there will be turns along the way and that's fine, everyone does it. 
Last but not least, uh, we're uh, aggressively hiring. Um, um, we're actually on the second floor. If you guys are interested to uh, hear about uh, more about the team and what you're doing, um, growing people into leadership is something that we've always been interested in. If you look at uh, the leadership that we have right now, the leadership team we have right now, we have been notorious for um, uh, preferring to internally groom people than external hires. So we have good programs within the company to help people get into management and help them make this transition. Um, so reach out to us if, you, um, if you're interested to find out more. And now I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Any questions for Mohamed? Uh, from my experience, uh, one of the, uh, the, the situations that is very hard to manage is that people want to, to be a leader uh, uh, and they don't have enough experience for that. In your opinion, do you believe that time is something that is very important to lead for one person to grow from, from software, software engineer to be a leader of a team of five or ten persons? What is your opinion about this need of time to grow to a, a next level? Um, yeah, so I think I think in terms of management itself, I, I don't necessarily agree entirely with the concept of time because like that sentence in itself, I think it's a, it's a bit of a paradox, right? If we say like people who want to become leaders don't have the necessary experience, if this is, if this is a true statement, no one would ever be a manager, right? Because if you don't have experience and a manager, you cannot be a manager, no one will be a manager. Um, but the, the time factor that I think is imp like important, I think um, for an engineering manager, for example, to be able to successfully manage a group of engineers, they need to have a deep understanding of the craft itself, of the profession. They need to know how people learn, they need to pe know how people grow, they need to know how people get to become better at their job, what gets them motivated, what gets them demotivated, and so on. And I think that is important for someone to become an engineering manager, for example. So for us, the way we see it, anyone who's a, at least a senior engineer, this automatically quali qualifies that person to start a transition into management. We work with these people to understand like, okay, this is the responsibilities and the, the, the competencies that we expect of a manager. This is the assessment that we have of the person and his self-assessment or her, her self-assessment. And then we do this kind of delta analysis and then we see what kind of development programs we can cater to, to that person to provide them with the necessary knowledge or the necessary experience that they need to become a successful manager. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I have one. It's regarding internal promotion, okay? So if you are promoted to a manager within the team that you're already in, you'll, you go from seeing everyone, or everyone goes from seeing you as a colleague to seeing you as a manager, and that relationship yeah. changes and potentially can cause some friction and whatever. Do you have any tips for how to manage that transition from seeing the people around you as colleagues to being perceived as their manager? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think, so A, just to be completely honest, I think this is unavoidable. I think that's, a, that's the price. People have to pay it. The, your relationship will change in some parts. Uh, but to the degree to, uh, or the extent to how much this relationship would change is something that you can control. Acknowledging your power is something that I just mentioned. I think this is very important that you do, you're very careful about like, the change in dynamics and you make sure that you play this in your favor and like, you play this in a way that actually gets them to be more comfortable with you. Um, and the second part is like, just being extremely empathetic with your team. I think this is like, a very important thing to have. Um, and I think that can dilute a lot this kind of change in the dynamic of how you interact with each other. Um, so just having a lot of empathy to them and understanding where they're coming from and how, like being supportive to your team and so on, and this will, the, the relationship will still be different, but it still will be on the good side, different, not bad different, you know, if, if, if this makes sense, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. No more questions? Before? Okay, round of applause.